Hello and welcome to our second season, third episode of our podcast. We're super excited because we have a really fun breakdown of helping you understand more about the brain, the behaviors, and connecting all those dots. So today we're talking about breaking down of brain-related behaviors versus learned behaviors. So it's going to be a fun episode. Yeah, it's a good one. I feel like a lot of us think that our behaviors are, I mean, mean, we've said this before, but our behaviors are who we are and the things we do define us as people. And this is kind of to shed light on the things that maybe are something that you learned and you picked up from parents or from whatever. And also looking at what is, what behaviors are coming from your disorganized brain, from primitive, retain primitive reflexes, from other stuff that's just kind of holding you back. And it doesn't mean that that's who you are. So that's kind of why we wanted to do this episode. I love talking about this. Obviously we do. That's why we podcast, but I, I love to share this even more. And I oftentimes will bite my le- tongue, hold my tongue. I don't know what you say, tongue. the expression hold correctly. <laughs> I will yeah. hold my tongue when I hear people say, oh, I just have this going on with me. And I was like, but did you know that's a reflex? It's a primitive reflex. And that just means it's on right now. And you have within you the tools to integrate it. So you do not have this. And I was just talking to someone and they're like, oh, my posture. I just want to sit like this all the time. And I'm like, oh, your posture, that's a reflex. You should have your reflexes integrated. So that way that postural reflex can turn on. And come on. So we're going to break down for you the primitive reflexes again. So if you haven't heard it yet, we're going to break them down, make it make even more sense of what <laughs> what behaviors are actually connected to how your brain is wired, okay? Exactly. Remember, primitive reflexes are automatic instinctual movements that are designed to keep you alive in the first year of life. Your goal as a teeny tiny baby, even starting in utero, you're supposed to be moving in specific patterns and specific ways that you have innately wired into you. You do it enough and your brain's like, all right, cool. I'm ready to move on to the next one. And then once you've done all the movements and they've all become integrated, then they lie dormant. They lie dormant for when true survival comes at you. Now in today's world, we're not living in true survival. Most of us, this is a generalization, obviously, but we are interpreting it as survival. Mm -hmm. And we say this over and over. People think that traffic, not finding a parking spot, um, being late or whatever it is, turns the brain into that survival mode. So we're here to share with you, you can get out of that mode. And it's so easy to do 20 minutes a day. I shouldn't say easy. It's simple. It's not easy. It's It's not easy. It's hard work. Especially in the beginning, it's hard to get used to it, but it's so worth it. And that's why we share a lot of our member stories and all of our testimonials and stuff on on social media because it really does change people's lives it's changed our lives and it changed everybody who's actually done the program we have hundreds of members thousands of people who have done it before you know before we even started online mm-hmm. whose life it has changed so we're very confident in saying if you do it might not be easy, but it will change your life. And I think um, one thing that I wanted to also say is you're going to hear these behaviors and you're going to say, well, a lot of the time you're going to say, well, what's the big deal? Why is that a problem that I do that? Well, it's not a problem inherently, but it does mean that your brain is working a lot harder than it needs to. So while the behavior itself might be like, eh, doesn't matter. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother anybody else. It might still mean that your brain just doesn't have the bandwidth that you went, that you could have, right. To really be yourself and to live your life in the cortex. And I hope that makes sense. We'll, we'll get into it as we have examples. I love that you just said that because so many people, when we say change, they're like, oh, what does that mean? That's scary. Right. And so when we say change, we don't mean you change who you are. We, ch- you change your response to your environment and it yes. becomes automatic. So if you are wired to be a fight person that goes away and you become a calmer, more neutral, level-headed person who can see both sides, right? Both of us. And moi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and honestly, um, and it's the simplest thing. So, you know, when babies are little and a loud noise happens, they're like sleeping cozy, comfy, and then all of a sudden they hear a noise they like, and they fling their arms out, they open their hands, they take a deep inhale and then they they start to turn red. They usually start to cry and then they will come back into this, position of kind of curled back up. That is a reflex. If you hear a loud noise, 
if you're so babies can't walk they can't talk they can't do a whole lot they can just cry right and they can try to move in specific patterns to save themselves so that movement alerts the system to wake up it's time to go into survival mode something might be coming at you right and the thing is, is there's a time and place for a baby to do this. We want babies yes. to be doing this between two to four months of life actively. They do that startle reflex. It's what it looks like. It's a big startle. And then they calm back down. It needs to do it enough times until the brain's like, okay, I got that pattern. I know what it is. Now I can let that lie dormant. So if we're swaddling babies, they're not getting that flinging of the arms out, right? And so then their brain didn't have a chance to go through it. So then that reflex remains on. It didn't yes. go through and it, its full pattern. Exactly. And it also has to do not just swaddling, but also when we're kind of overprotecting them, so to speak, right? When some babies that just really don't get that movement or that aren't mm -hmm. really exposed to different things, kids that are maybe left on their back all day, right? They're sitting in a chair all day. They're not getting the exposure of, I'm going to hear that sound. Sometimes it also has to do when you're, when the head changes position. So if a baby is like, moving around, crawling around, and the head changes position in a weird way that, which is what usually happens when they're sleeping, right? When they're dreaming about something and they, they, they kind of get thrown off. It's happened to all of us when you're, you know, when you kind of wake up like that in a startle, they're not getting the opportunity to startle. And so what happens is that they're stuck with the infant startle reflex instead of it developing into the adult startle reflex, because adults do have a startle reflex as well. We all have it. But everybody, we've all been there, right? When you're like, right. whoa, that was really loud. Or somebody right. came out of nowhere. Came out of nowhere, right? And you, if you have an adult startle reflex, you have the ability to startle, look at what's going on, decide whether it's a threat or not, and then go on with your life or go into survival mode, right? If it is something dangerous, then you got to get into that fight or flight. Wow. But if it's not, then you're like, okay, whew, take a deep breath within a minute, you're back to your baseline, you're fine, right? If you right. don't, then that's where, and this is where a lot of people, I talk about this with people that I talk about this stuff with, like my friends and stuff. If you are somebody who gets startled, one, very easily, even mm -hmm. if you know, like, even if you know who's in the house, they're over there, blah, blah, and you walk into them in the in the hallway and they th it throws you into that startle and you're like, why did I get so startled? I knew you were there, right? And that response lasts five 10, sometimes like half an hour or an hour for some people where you're still like, oh, I can't calm down. That's how you know also that it's the, the infant startle reflex, the moro is still active and that you need to integrate it. Yeah. So some signs. So you can trigger the moral reflex with sudden unexpected occurrence of any kind. And this is through, like Paloma said, a head movement, noise, like I mentioned, anything in the visual realm or anything tactile pain or anything that's mm -hmm. temperature change or being handled too roughly. That will turn that reflex on, okay? Now, what happens is the physical response to it is oftentimes looked at as the difficult child or difficult person. Yes. So this is the key part here is that as a baby, we don't really make too much. Oh, they cried. Okay, that makes sense. But as adults or as even older children is, um, yeah. in kindergarten and up, if they're having these responses to that reflex being activated, then we perceive them as, oh, they're so difficult and they're so challenging. Exactly. So that's what we're here to dispel is that it's not that they're trying to be. It's an automatic reaction that's coming over their system thinking they need to survive, okay? So that exactly. looks like instantaneous arousal. It looks like rapid inhalation, momentary freeze or startle followed by expiration, often accompanied by a cry, activation of the fight or flight response, which is the main one that we see. And mm -hmm. that is when it's telling the sympathetic nervous system, it's time to go, yeah. which is releasing the adrenaline, the cortisol into the system. That's what Paloma just said. It takes a long time to calm down. And that in and of itself, like some people are like, well, I'm just easily started. Like, it's not that big of a deal. You might think what well, that's one of those behaviors, right? You're like, well, whatever. I just get started. It's no big deal. But it is a big deal because your body is being flooded with chemical that it doesn't know how to release and it doesn't need to release right now. Right. Yeah. So if your body's flooded with cortisol five times a day, cause you get startled five times a day on the, on average, that's, that's cortisol. That's like going through your veins, through your body setting up your body for fight or flight, but you're not going into that fight or flight so that those chemicals get stuck, get trapped in the body. And that's where we have a lot of inflammation, a lot of long-term challenges that come with, it, it can cause anxiety. It can cause so many different things. I mean, we can do a whole episode on the, uh, the effects of 
high cortisol in the body, right? I mean, this is something that's been studied over the years, right? So it might not seem like it's a big deal to just get startled, but actually your body, it is a big deal for your body. A hundred percent. So when I, and this is when I was living in Ecuador, I did not have a developed and integrated um, moral reflex. So I felt like, and I, I mean, when I was in Quito, it was definitely survival, but my brain took it to the next level because I did go through some encounters like being robbed at gunpoint and stuff like that, where it definitely was true survival, right? Yeah, that's scary. Um, but then every occurrence of leaving the house, my system would go into sympathetic state of like, I have to survive. And, and that's so, neuroplasticity working yes. because neuroplasticity, your brain's like, okay, last time I went out, something very scary happened. So now every time I go out and that's trauma that's getting stored in your, your system, in your brain and in your literal body. I mean, it's, yes. it's there, right? I, and it's a physiological yes. response. I aged like 10 years living there for two. So yeah. we could go through every single reflex and help you make sense of it, but that it would make this episode three hours long. So our <laughs> point here is we want to give like a minor thing. Like let's just take communication, for example, let's yeah. say you're talking to, whether it be your friend, your spouse, your neighbor, whoever it is, if there is a trigger to their system while you're in the middle of a conversation, then it could have them react in a very aggressive way. Mm -hmm. And it will show up as a fight or flight symptom. And right. so that is a brain related behavior. And what we love about our program is that in 20 minutes, in less than 20 minutes, because the whole thing it's daily right. is 20 minutes, but yeah. like just integrating your moral reflex takes you less than 30 seconds a day. Yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. instant. Like I was actually just in here with my mom and she knows that I talk about her in the podcast a lot. We love her. She's amazing. Um, And she was just doing her morals yeah. and she was falling backwards when she was doing it. And she's like, is that bad? And I was like, it's not bad. It just means that that moral turned back on. And yeah our reflexes can turn back on quite quickly. If our yep. system is hit with enough stressors, it goes, oh, it's time to survive again. And that's what we're talking about. What we've been talking about on the podcast is that nowadays we get stressors all over the place. I genuinely think, I mean, listen, I love my TikTok as much as the next gal, am I right? But <laughs> this is triggering our, our survival, yes. bro. Like I don't know all of the science on this. And I know that there's still so much, so many people that are looking at the actual effects of having the screens in our faces. You and I work on a screen, right? Like it's wow. this type of light and the overstimulation, just the amount of information that we have is too much overstimulating us and putting us back into that fight or flight, which is why once again, it's a lifestyle, right? Like you have to learn these tools and then apply them literally for the rest of your life. And I like that we talked about the moral because I feel like that's the most commonly retained uh, reflex. But like you're saying, like this is somebody that if you're talking about something, they get upset about it, they go into that rage, right? And we all know somebody like that. Mm. What do people say about them? Oh, you know, she's really nice. She just, you know, she has a short fuse. So just like, be careful, right? How many people, I, I used to be like that, right? I think my friends mm -hmm. used to tell their friends like, you know, beware Paloma's like, you know, she can get a little intense sometimes. And I was that person, you know, and I was constantly just like picking and picking and picking fights with people. And I was like, it's just my personality, right? And I was like, whatever, it's fine. It's part of my personality. And not until I did my brain work. And then I came back to Mexico City, my friends were like, whoa, you're this just way. like the fun part all the time now. And I was like, oh, cool. Well, obviously not all the time, but you know what I mean? Like you're just like the fun version of yourself now and you're not going into that fight or flight mode. I didn't think it was a problem before, but now maybe not a problem, but it was definitely something that it was nice to get out of that because I didn't realize how much time I had spent in that like fight or flight response. And sometimes, you know, you're in that response without even knowing, like, for example, when I worked, and this is something you and I have talked about, right, just going back to the cortisol really quick, I worked in uh, ABA settings with kids with autism for almost, I think, seven years, maybe eight years. Mm -hmm. And you are just constantly in fight or flight, because you're like, hyper aware of everything that's going on with the kids. We had to do restraints. It was horrible. Like some days, if a kid was having a hard time, I would be restraining a child literally all day at work. And it was just so stressful. And the amount of cortisol that you have in your body from that, I genuinely think I'm still recovering from it. Like I get my it. body changed, my metabolism changed, my skin yeah. changed, everything changed when I started yes, working in those, in those settings. And at the same time, it's the most rewarding thing you can ever do in the world, in the life and in the world. And I love my students so much and I miss them every single day, right? But it's like, 
you're in that, in that moment and you need to find that way to like release this stuff, you know? And even though I was doing the brain work, it wasn't enough, you know, I needed to, I wasn't doing it all the time. I wasn't doing the subconscious work, wasn't looking at what the triggers were, were, were with Mm -hmm. that stuff. And so once again, I just thought it was just part of who I was. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say though, I had already done a lot of brain work by then. So that's also why I think I was good at that stuff. Cause I wasn't getting like, like some teachers would get totally shocked and I'd be like, that's their moral, right? Because like, you know, if somebody chucks a phone at your face, like it, it's yeah. shocking and it yeah. hashtag hurts a lot, you know, <laughs> but that's also kind of like being in those situations that you notice, like who's yeah. in that mode and who's not, right? Well, and, and that's exactly it. So you're in that state, right? Now your system is predicting it. So yes. then your system starts to call that in and that mirroring neuron effect is then going to challenge their system and then it just, right? And that's what we oh, totally. do is because, and that's what I always say, this goes for every relationship. If you're calm, like you all meet those people who are like just so calming, yes. it's because they have their reflexes integrated, right? Yes. Or at least they have most of them integrated and most of the lower centers of the brain integrated. And, um, and then, but if you're already thinking it's going to happen and you're yes. predicting it, then it comes through and that happens. And so with my kids, yeah. just like what you experienced about calming your system, as soon as I integrated my reflexes and literally my nervous system just chilled out. Now yeah. my kids' nervous systems chill out. So they start yep. to go to meltdown mode. I'm not mirroring it anymore. I'm in calm zone. Ah, there's the thumbs up. <laughs> I go into my calm zone and then they don't escalate. So imagine exactly. if imagine if you were working on your brain and then the child you're working with also started working on their brain, then your systems would start to co-regulate and start exactly. to up together. Well, and that's what happened with the kids that I was working with after school because I was right. going and doing brain work sessions after school. And those kids, some of them were at the school that I work where I worked and they were just like, doing so amazingly well because of that. Right. And because the whole family is participating and, you know, it's a whole thing, but it's also like, yeah, looking at that way that you respond, I think is just uh, an enormous thing. And I think also just as we're going to talk about that in a little bit is the conception that we have and the preconceptions that we have about people. That was my number one frustration working in schools. Cause I came from working in business. Like I had never been in a school before and the, the way that some of the teachers would just get there in the morning. Good morning. How's it going? Oh, I have this kid. I know he's going to have a rough day. Cause I know mom told me that he ate a lot of sugar last night. He didn't sleep. So it's good. I'm going to have a really rough day. And I'd be like, yeah. you not say it right now. Like, let's maybe you will have a rough day. Maybe you won't. That's just life. Let's flow. Like, why are you deciding right now that this kid mm-hmm. is going to have a meltdown? You're his teacher. Of course he's going to have a meltdown if you just right. decided it. From this, he isn't even here yet. He's having oh, his breakfast home, you know? They feel it. And they feel it so much. And I remember, like, there was just some kids that were really tough. And their teachers would, like, the, their case managers would be like, yeah, that kid, you know, there's no there's no hope for that kid. You know, I remember one, yeah. one specifically. And that's, you know, they pick up on that. Oh, my gosh. Well, that is literally it. Words and energy have so much power. So if you totally. walk in, and this is where Paloma and I, we will toot our own horns. We are really good at working with kids because yeah. we don't see them as, here comes bad Johnny who's going to yes. have an explosive. We go, dude, Johnny, he just needs to do some more exploding rocks. And then we get to see the real Johnny because he doesn't. Yeah. And, and I, I know will tell the you real this, Johnny. Yeah. From being a recovering road rager, Hot <laughs> Mess Express. It was never fun to be that person. It was never, ever fun. And everyone who's listening right now, you've all been there where you're like, why did I say and do X, Y, and Z? I don't like who that was. You all know that feeling. Nobody wants to do that. And that's Mm -hmm. what we're trying to share with you is you don't have to. But you do have to do some aligned action right now and actually do our program and integrate your reflexes. Get on the floor and cream and crawl and take care of your brain so you can show up differently. And Paloma just beautifully segued us into the subconscious because we're talking about behavior. So we can literally watch how you move. We'll tell you what's brain related and we'll say, this is that reflex not integrated. Here's the lower center of the brain, either the pons or the midbrain. We look at how you move and we tell you exactly where your brain's at. Every time it's amazing. Then we start to look into the subconscious. Now the subconscious is incredible. We've talked about it before because it's over 95% driving who you are daily. You don't even- think about it. Obviously it's subconscious. Yeah. So it starts <laughs> when your parents or who, however you're conceived, 
And that moment you were taking on whatever energy came before you. Remember, we were all eggs in our moms when our grandmothers were pregnant with them. Yep. So think about that generation of what was being thought of, what was being passed down. And I love there is a whole wave right now on social media of like, I am a first generation gentle parent. Like the consciousness that's coming through right now is amazing. Is it easy to be okay. a gentle parent? Absolutely not, because it takes <laughs> the spotlight on you and being like, why am I doing this? And mm -hmm. I just heard this, by the way, I'm sure you've seen it, or I don't know if your algorithm hits that way. <laughs> why is it that we're so triggered by our kids? And it's really because like, let's say my kids who are four and seven, and I've had a lot of ahas with my four-year-old because her yeah. and I are very similar. Four-year-old Siggy is where four-year-old Danny was, but didn't get what she needed. And so mm. now I'm giving four-year-old Siggy what Danny, little Danny needed. Ooh, and that like, crazy. and then like, even my kids were afraid of the dark at night. And I'm like, oh, right. the difference is you guys have your brain work, right? I didn't have brain work when I was little. Yeah. And now I'm like, but have I healed the scared little Danny version? Right. And so now I'm like, I think I'm keeping that alive still a little bit. So yeah. this is what's so cool is when you start to dive into the subconscious and you start to look at, okay, we were just talking about the difficult child, right? He was always just being already programmed to believe he was going to be hard. He was going to be the tough kid. So then he already knew I'm tough and my subconscious is going to operate from being the kid that doesn't cooperate and has meltdowns. That's my and MO. This once again, comes to the, the fact that the brain always wants to confirm what it already knows yes. to be true. Yes. Knows if you're only listening, I'm doing qu air quotes, right? Yes. Knows to be true. So right. if the brain quote unquote, knows that you're a difficult kid, then it's going to prove that to you over and over and over because it's a confirmation bias, right? I already know this. I am yep. difficult. Yep. I'm a really, really tough, horrible kid. Mm -hmm. And I'm confirming it all the time with my mom, with my dad, with my teachers, with my grandparents, with my caregivers, anybody that's around me, right? Mm -hmm. Or I am a dumb, so I'm going to continue. That's also very common because the school system, and I think we've done an episode about the school system already, but we could do a million of them. Yes. The school system is not set up for divergent brains, neurodivergent no. brains, which at this point, neurotypical, what is that? Never heard right. of it. Like That's nobody right. is actually neurotypical. It's a great idea for studying and for research. I don't think anybody in the world right well, now yeah. is actually neurotypical. Like we all I have mean, something that's different. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I mean, if you have all your reflexes integrated, all your lower brain developed, and you have zero subconscious beliefs that are interfering with you, then right, you but then you're a robot. Like, like, but that doesn't exist because we're human. That right? Like <laughs> genuinely, I don't think there's one person that can yeah. actually say that. Because also yeah. think about how many like new subconscious things come up every day. Oh, and sometimes you realize, oh my God, this is a new trigger, or whatever. And so that's the kid that a lot of kids get labeled as dumb or they're not good enough. And so that's what they're confirming with their life all the time. And we can have, we, you've all seen this, right? Where you have the same exact experience as somebody who's next to you and they perceived it in such a different way. Genuinely, that is what it is. It's your brain confirming what it already quote unquote knows to be true. And the knowing, mm, not so real. Am I right? Like right. you can quote unquote know all these things, but they're not real. They're just your subconscious beliefs. They're not always going to be true. Some of them are, most of them, if they're negative, they're not. They're not. And they, they're what not. we call it, like, it's your BS, your belief system. It's your yes, exactly. self-fulfilling prophecy. Of, and here's what's crazy. So let's say a reflex gets triggered, a lower brain a part behavior comes online, right? And so now you're operating from what we call survival mode, a dysregulated nervous system. Mm -hmm. And then your confirmation bias to it is C- I knew I am always this person, right. right? And so once you come out of survival mode and you're not triggered the same way, yep. your nervous system doesn't dysregulate and get thrown out of whack anymore. You don't need to go feel like, oh, I'm overstimulated. You're just like, yep. oh, I'm literally sitting in sadness. I'm literally yeah. sitting in anger, but I am not exploding. I'm not slamming doors. I'm not flipping people off. I'm not doing the behaviors associated with my normal nervous system. So you have to up, you have to completely upset that nervous system and be like, no, 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 that's not how I want to operate. Cause I was raised in chaos. I don't want to be in chaos anymore. And yeah. you have to effort through that. And it's, and it, and it changes also like for depending on what 
it's not always the chaos, right? Like for you, it's the chaos that you're thinking of, right? But it can be something else completely. It can be like something very passive or feeling bad about yourself or whatever it might be, right? For each person. Uh, When I just went to the nutritionist um, last week and I hadn't like weighed myself in a million years and I looked at the number and uh, I was like, okay, normally like a year ago, that would have thrown me into full crisis mode. it's a high number okay yeah. it's high but i'm like listen whatever that's what it is right now mm-hmm. i'm already here i'm working on it and i'm you know i'm i'm actively pursuing right. a healthier life for yeah. my body but i that's exactly it i looked at the same trigger that would have actually sent me into a full crisis a year ago two years ago and i was like meh okay well what gotta if- work on it you know because you get you're better. Ner- yeah your nervous system is now regulated exactly and now you can say I'm not happy with the way this feels, but I don't have to go cry for five hours. I don't need to go shame myself. I need to say, ooh, what's coming up for me right now? Mm -hmm. What do I want to move forward through? And I think that has been my biggest change too, is saying, okay, my nervous system now is regulated. So now when I get hit with the trigger of, ooh, I didn't like how that felt. I don't Mm -hmm. like that feeling. What am I going to do about it? And that's where we come in with the reconnects and we help you then reframe how do you want to see yourself differently so it's like you literally get to put a different lens on and you get to see yourself as x y and z we're big into let's first look at the nervous system how are you showing up from a brain perspective is there a behavior you're showing that is related to your primitive reflexes your pawns Mm -hmm. or your midbrain once we rule that out then we look at the subconscious why are you still showing up in the same space and paloma okay this is good we have to share this because what's paloma's favorite hashtag every episode society's expectation every episode right and then i just asked her like two days ago i was like have you actually been checked yourself on caring about society's expectations? And it was like, her system was like, I actually care. <laughs> yeah. I was like, she was like, duh. I did a but, reconnect. And then I she did, did it, a reconnect but yeah. and it was like, but see, that's how this work is, right? So you'll have things show up in your life multiple times. And yes. until you're ready, like maybe you've been yes. listening to our podcast for a while. You're like, this sounds fascinating. This sounds too good to be true. Yes. We get that a lot. And yeah. um, it's, it is so good to be able to feel good. It is it, it is not too good to be true. You do have to effort though. That's the one caveat. Yeah, absolutely. But once you start to realize, okay, this has shown up for me so many times and I keep saying it and I don't even realize yeah. I'm saying it. And then you check with your subconscious of like, okay, there's a reason I kept saying it over and over is because it actually meant something to me. That's the biggest thing for me, but also something that I would have not been able to do 10 years ago or yeah. whenever, you know what I mean? Like before I did my brain work, I feel like we've strayed a lot from the topic of the behaviors, but I still it's think it's been connected. a very good conversation. Well, it's all connected though, because the subconscious is all things that are programmed into us. Right. And then we get to take our time to then decide, is that who I am? So if we're someone who's like always saying sorry or giving into things or we're, you know, oh, this is just how I am or or the best one these days is the weaponized incompetence that's coming through. That's the subconscious. That's the subconscious yes. just saying, you know what, you've overruled me for so much that I just can't do it. And I'm actually going to do it wrong. So you don't ever actually have to ask me to do it again. Like there's so many that's different a learned behavior it. too. It's a learned like, behavior. This is both, right? right? So it's the learned behavior of Whenever I say I can't do something, it always, or I pro- procrastinate it, somebody else is gonna, solves it for me. So right. why would I ever try to do anything on my own if somebody's always going to do it for me? But then the other hand of it, of the subconscious, right, kind of like the brain perspective is you might feel like you're not good enough at things. And so you never want to try to do anything because you think you might mess up because you got that messaging when you were younger of you're a screw up, you never do anything right, whatever it might be for each person. and that's also with shaping. Like, I don't even want to try. And that's a lot of people that get scared of like fear of failure, fear of, of even fear of success. Right. Cause what if I mess it up? Right. And so that's kind of the the subconscious piece for that one. Um, and I think even, and for saying, sorry, it's also like similar where the, the learned behavior can be, I 
have have been gotten in trouble so much when I was younger that I always had to apologize. Always thought everything was my fault because for whatever reason, a caregiver, an older sibling, whoever it was, always made everything seem like it was my fault. So I'm always saying sorry, sorry, excuse me, can you say that? we know whatever. And on the other hand, the brain the brain perspective might be my proprioceptive system is totally dysregulated, so I am constantly bumping into people and bumping yeah. into things. So I'm used to saying sorry because it's usually my fault because I don't know where my personal bubble is. I don't know where my body is in space. So that's the other. You know, there's always two sides to it and sometimes it's a combination of both right yeah. and usually is so yeah. that's where we love getting to go through this with our members and help them make sense of like where is this act like what is the root right like what is the yeah. actual root that is keeping this alive and so we walk you through the process of figuring yourself out and this my favorite part now is like up oh, i know exactly where that came from and then i can right without feeling it again and without experiencing the trauma again whether it be a big or small trauma I can now just go okay wait nope I don't have to feel it put my nervous system back into it but I can say actually I want this lens instead this is how I want to see it differently and I can shift my perception immediately and so now I walk in the space of seeing so many other people who have that going on yes we just want to create a world of a safe space for people to say, Hey, we're all doing the best that we can with the tools we have. And have you tried these tools yet? These tools change your life because it gets you to a place with not having to think your way through. Agreed. And thinking your way through is what most people are doing and we don't even know it. And that's what most approaches are, are based on is going through the cortex and thinking your way through things, thinking your way through what might have happened when you were younger, what your triggers are, whatever. And it's not saying that we're not going to think, we aren't thinking, but you got to address the subconscious before and the and the primitive reflex is the primitive brain, right? If not, all that you can do all the thinking you want, the second the trigger comes up again, you're going to go back into that fight or flight oh, mode. Yeah. And that what you were just saying earlier about reliving it, that's something that Lisa Miller talks about in the in the book that we're reading for book club. The Awakened Brain. Such a good book, The Awakened Brain. We should plug this into the show notes so people can join. I mean, there's not that much time yet left to read it, but if you go on Audible, put it on 1.25, which is what I did. Just yeah. listen to the book. It's great. Um, yeah. But I I feel like she was talking about how when she started training as a psychiatrist, she was doing her rounds at you know, some, some hospital in New York. She All the approaches in that time, I think it was like the 80s, were – having people relive the traumas that made them end up where they are. So these are people that have a lot of psychiatric disorders. They have uh, addictions, you know, all this stuff. And all the approaches, all the doctors were saying, okay, now go back. What happened when you were three years old? What happened when you were five? What happened when you were seven? And she was like, this isn't helping them. They're just, of course, part of, of course, remembering something that happened to you is going to help you understand what trauma could have caused and what could have come after that, right? But- Why do you have to relive it every single day, every single session that you have with your psychiatrist? And so that was a huge thing. And in her really revolutionizing the current way of looking at spirituality, looking at the brain, looking at the way that we see trauma. And I mean, she's just an amazing inspiration. We love her. And I just think that's such a big thing that a lot of, a lot of modalities still have, right? Is that going back and reliving and putting your body and your brain back into that into that memory into that traumatic thing that happened to you and we've seen so many people notice changes and go back and rewire patterns that were in their brain in their body totally felt like it was hardwired just by doing the brain work getting rid of it without having to go back and relive those really really difficult situations because everybody's got something that that you know can trigger them again 100% and i think that is where it doesn't have to be so complicated. It doesn't have yeah. to be so hard. And I think that's what we're all so used to. Everything is just being such a giant mountain to tackle. And we yes. give you the smallest doable to start. And the minute you start our program, we're not talking about subconscious beliefs right away. We're talking about do your morrows, making an X and creep, get five minutes okay. of creeping in a day. Yep. And then like, as your system starts to regulate, then all of a sudden you can build. And so you're exactly. building. And so by the time you get to level two, you're like, now I'm hungry to go deeper. And this is where our members are like, okay, now what, now what? Right. And I yeah. love, because we have our WhatsApp group. That's all about accountability and people are in there just like, oh my gosh, I had this huge revelation about this is where it came from. And then I was able to shift it to this. 
anybody have ideas on how I can shift this? And so that's where you are in a community where we're supporting you. We're all speaking the same language and exactly. it's exciting stuff because things are happening. Guess what, Paloma? This is an amazing me. episode, but we have to wrap this up. And I we think do. I'm ready to do the, oh, yeah, it's okay. Gonna, so bear with me, y'all. I'm going to give us the the outing here, the outro, if you will. And the first things first, if you're listening and you want to get started on the program today, we do have a promo code for you. It is Brainiac and you can get $10 off your first payment of our program. Remember, it's 12 payments of $47 a month. And then when you're done paying after the year, you're done, but you still have access. We are a lifetime brand with lifestyle options to change your life. So that's where we're at. This is 2024 where we're like going for more, right? Okay. So if you want to find Is us on right? social media, I know. Um, you can find us on TikTok at in underscore the underscore underscore cortex. Oh, I almost had it perfect. If That's you want to find us at Instagram, you can find us at in the cortex underscore us. We also have a Spanish one. So it's in the cortex underscore ESP, that one we're working on. So if you're a Spanish speaker or you want to send this to your Spanish speaking friends, that's that one. Um, Facebook is in the cortex US. If you want to write us an email, hello at in the cortex.com. Our website is www.inthecortex.com. And I think I got them all right. We have a YouTube channel. You did great. Channel. That was fantastic. YouTube that's all. A YouTube, YouTube channel is in the cortex US as well. I mean, there we go. If you just Google us, no. next, you'll find us. So, oh, 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 I did somewhat cheat and had some of them pulled up. But hey, that's neither here nor there. Well, okay. <laughs> we are so happy you're here. Thank you for joining us. We're going to break down behaviors on our next episode and go deeper, I think, and keep going. So stay we'll tuned. Yes. Thank you. 